we had um, we had some some what we call them farewells. Obviously, um, the Sam Petrovsky Seaton deal ended up going through. We locked in uh, Lewis Young and we gave up or what was it pick fifty two or something. There was a three team deal, and then obviously we've had some some delistings in in um, I think it was Sam Ramsey and, and Michael Gibbons as well. We'll touch on Gibbons in a minute, but I just want to get your your reactions to the Sam Petrovsky Seaton news because I know that there was. I mean, I had it as well. You know, you fall in love with your boys that you draft and you hope that, you know, they're not leaving until you see them in another polo. Well, we saw Samo in a West Coast polo today. I mean, I heard you guys talk a little bit about it on, on your podcast as well. What was your reaction to the final news that he was gone? Yeah, so um, it was interesting. As, as you mentioned, he was one of those players that, and I think Lockie mentioned this on the podcast during the week, that, it's, it's when we drafted and went to the draft for this rebuild, he was one of the, I think, second year of the, of the rebuild, the first round pick. And you almost expect all of these guys to be there when we finally, you know, lift the, the premiership cup and have all of this success. So I guess to see one of those go, it's always disappointing to see him basically go for, for pick 52 is even more disappointing knowing, I guess, how much, how many games we've pumped into him and attempted development. Um, it's always quite disappointing. Um, but I think if you look at it in the end, and maybe I'm trying to be a bit more positive on it now that he's obviously moved on, I think trying to look at, at what we are building here, I don't want to be harsh to him because I, I loved I loved him and, and I love the service he's brought to the football club. But if we're going to, I guess, keep taking those next steps, there's probably a fair few chunk of players that we have currently on the list that are maybe in his mold of they kind of half forward, they're kind of pinch hit in the midfield. We don't know where their best position is. They haven't been consistent. We're sort of hoping that they come on and obviously that's never guaranteed. So I guess to lose one of those isn't the end, isn't the worst thing to happen. And I think for the fact that we've been able to bring in maybe a Lewis Young that we needed a key defender, we maybe didn't need another one of these half forward midfielders. I think that the return in the end, hopefully can look good in, in a couple of years, but it's all always going to be disappointing to lose one of those almost like foundation members of the rebuild. Yeah. I mean, yeah, like I said, you know, in a fairy tale world, we draft the kids that we draft and they all go on to be part of the premiership side. And, you know, the the reality is like that's just not common. It doesn't happen all the time like that, especially when you have, you know, multiple seasons of uh, we'll call it underachieving. I think it, I always find it a little tricky to say that word because it's I, I sort of remind myself, am I overrating our list or do I believe that we have a lot of talented players that I'm I'm certain yeah. we have a lot of talented players, but yeah, when I sort of look back on Samuel, I just feel like, I mean, there was an opportunity there. I would assume for him to have that fresh slate. Um, I'm not convinced that it's purely based on the midfield time that Teague was or wasn't giving him. I'm just, maybe I'm in denial, but I, I just, it's a shame because I would have loved for him to, you know, speak to Voss, Voss say, this is what I'm going to need from you to crack into this position that you want to play and him go. But then on the other end, it's like, all right, well, that's why we brought in free agency and such things. So players can have a bit more empowerment and some, some movement. And ultimately I'm, I'm disappointed. Um, but that's just more of a, you know, it's an emotion thing because I love Samo. Yeah, no, I completely agree with you both. And I think it's similar to, I think the discussion we're about to have about Big Gibbo is that plenty of these players that the fans call for, you know, get them into the midfield. And there's just, there's just a finite amount of players that can make that spot. And, and some players shine and they get their way in and then you can't push them out. But blokes like SPS, like, yeah, maybe he didn't get as much opportunity as he could have. And that's, you know, you can, you can debate that point if you want, but yeah, he had a, he had a really good crack and yeah, definitely sad to see him go. But we, we, we knew that not every top high pick that we took through this rebuild was going to be there for the premiership side. And there's still a whole bunch of them that have been amazing and are going to be there for it. So, yeah. Mm. Yeah, well said. We will move on to the next item, which is Michael Gibbons. <laughs> Your man? <sighs> he was my man. Um, let's just set the tone, give it the full context it deserves. So... <laughs> So Gibbo's gone on SCN. He's not happy that he's been delisted. And fair enough. No one should, you know, no one should be happy when, when such things have happened. Um, but he he spoke on SCN with Gary and Tim, and I've I've put it into, I've condensed it into the the highlights of the interview. So this is what Gibbo had to say. What's your initial uh, response and reaction and emotion to the news that uh, you won't be running around for the blues next year? 
Uh, I'm pretty disappointed, fellas. Um, yeah, it was, it was, I, I, I say it was a bit of a shock, but I felt, uh, just the way the clubs work, you both understand. I could see the writing on the wall a little bit there from um, probably the you know the latter part of the year once they announced the review. Um, so I could see things weren't turning my way, just some conversations, and then people stopped talking to you, and it sort of goes that way. Um, and then, so yeah, but obviously still want the call. I was completely like, you know, uh, uh, bitterly disappointed and yeah pretty flat mate pretty flat to be fair but did you feel like you got the opportunity to play the position that you play best uh, like in the end we uh when I first got there obviously I was like a pretty dominant midfielder in the, um, in the VFL and, and then Bolts was obviously in charge when I first got there and the the, uh, the need for a small pressure form was basically the only way I could really get a spot on the list so I sort of nutted down and went for that um, and then in the end, like the three years I spent there, I was solely focused on that, and I, I genuinely enjoyed it, um, putting time into that. So I think in the end, like I mentioned it the other day, but I sort of when they when they gave me the flick in the end, the, the, the justification that they they saw me as a, a good midfielder and that you know I, I play my best footy as a midfielder. Um, that's probably about it. Yeah, like I was just saying, I just heard the end of that team. Yeah, that was, as I said, that was probably what was more disappointing. I, they said they seem he's a really good midfielder, but I never played one minute in midfield for the Blues, unfortunately, which is, um, yeah, which was, but in the end, like, we never really, it never really um, turned me in the time because I was, you know, I was happy playing as a forward and um, learning the craft that way and thought, thought I was contributing that way. But, yeah, in the end, they, uh, <laughs> they sort of didn't see it that way, I guess. Uh, the coach and you know, the review and all those sorts of things. How, how would you describe the atmosphere in that past um, sort of the last ten weeks of the year? Yeah, it was incredibly stressful. Um, I, I think if you talk to anyone that was in it throughout that time, like you know, I think a lot of people will try and play it off. And um, but you know, people are you've got coaches that don't know if they'll be there next year, having to perform weekly and stay as positive people, players in the same position and. So it just creates a pretty, I guess, in the end, a pretty. Um, oh, I wouldn't say toxic, but like it's a pretty, it's, it's pretty unspoken about, I guess, to a point. But then when you sit down and have a chat to a couple of blokes towards the latter end of the year, like it's, it, it was getting to everyone. And um, as you say, like it's, it's, not, you know, no fault of the media or anything, but it's, it's in the media every day, and, um, and then it just becomes a, a bit of a cycle, doesn't it? Okay. So there's a bit to unpack here. Um, there were some points. I, I mean. From my point of view, I, I I was shocked because Gibbons to me represented exactly what I thought the list needed. A guy that had come the hard way, been overlooked initially, um, did his time in the VFL, continued to be overlooked, but kept playing, got his spot. And I thought it was a really good story. Um, maybe I'll ask you guys, what was your reaction to hearing that? <sighs> Take it away, Ian, while I digest this. Okay, yeah. Look, it's... It's interesting. I guess like if, you, if everyone listened to our podcast, um, doing like the list analysis and who we were, guess, I guess, delisting and to bring players in, I think we both delisted Mickey Gibbons. Um, the justification I think that we were giving were, okay, if you say he's a midfielder, we're bringing in a Chera and Hewitt. He's already down the pecking order of so many. So if he's looking to get in there, there probably isn't really a spot for him. And then you're looking at the small forwards. And I think, unfortunately, his biggest issue is he is 26 years old. So he's probably trying to hit his peak now. But I, I, don't, I unfortunately just don't think his level is... Like, I think he has a really good floor, but I don't think he has much of a ceiling as being that small forward. And, and you look at Durden, Honey, these guys that we have coming through, you're probably wanting to start to give these guys a little bit more of an opportunity to grow and be the guys that take us forward. So I guess when I first heard he was delisted, I wasn't probably too surprised. I was probably a little bit more surprised about Ramsey in the hope that maybe just because he's that little bit younger, I saw a little bit more going forward. Um, like I think in, in the perfect world, if we had a bigger list, you know, you'd probably want to keep a guy like Mickey Gibbons there because he can play a few positions. He's a bit more of that experienced body, but I, I just don't on personally, this is my opinion. Um, I don't see him being in our best 22 and, if I'm trying to give opportunities to guys coming through in the draft, you know, like a Jack Carroll in a couple of years, and it's like a list spot between those kind of guys, I'm unfortunately going to go for the younger guy over a uh, Mickey Gibbons. That's probably where I see it. Yeah. Uh, I, I was fuming. If I'm honest, I was, I was irate 
um, probably more because of the shock factor that that he would make such comments. I mean, I, there was another part of the interview where he said that his manager told him to just cool off for a week or so, and then you know we'll get back into the swing of things. So he's mm. uh, obviously emotions are high. He really didn't see it coming potentially. However, he did say that the writing was on the wall. There, there were a few things there, and I mean, I'm not here to um, give flames to excuses and just mentality that's not winning because we've done that for too long and the entitlement really crept in for me. That was my take on it. I, I, I was listening to a guy that thought he he was entitled to more than what than what he was. Um, and in, in many respects, I do think he was a bit stiff because he's a solid player. Um, yeah. He mentioned a few things like he could see the writing on the wall a little bit. You know, he mentioned that comment about people stop talking to him. So straight away, I'm like, all right, well, okay, great. You're very smart. You saw it coming. Why didn't you have this harsh conversation at the time there and nip it in the bud there? Why why was there no conversations on, hey, I'm noticing this is happening. What can I do to get better? Um, the next part for me was the, um, you know, the justification of the club. I play my best footy in the midfield. Um, I didn't play one minute in the in the midfield. That is a blatant lie. That's a lie. Yeah. That is a dead set lie. And then once I heard that, that's when the anger started sparking because he was never named in the midfield to start a game. But it's not like he never played in the midfield or never had a spurt in the midfield. Yeah. Um, and I just thought once he started lying there, I thought, oh, my God, he's, he's, he shouldn't be doing this interview. It's, he's, he's, he's too many emotions. And granted, we don't know the pressures that go on on the inside and, and what they're really thinking and what's going on. They're very isolated and all of that. But you make a choice to come on this interview and you make a choice to badmouth the club the way you did. I just, it was, for me, it was super disappointing and, and, and borderline unprofessional for me. Yeah. I, I agree with that, with what you said there about kind of, yeah, about the, the midfield minutes, I, I kind of lost the credibility in what he was saying. And w w when I originally saw his comments about the, um, you know, all the Teague stuff and the review and all that, those things that were going on. I thought that was really interesting, uh, but it kind of lost that credibility when it, I saw the comments about the midfield minutes, because like you said, it's just not true. And I think something that Ian and I always talk about is like, obviously through the season, you have your ins and outs of the week and there's always eight players that, you know, need to come in and then only two that people want to get dropped. And we're at this part of the season where delistings have to be made. And I, I agree that, Gibbons is not the worst player on our list and didn't deserve to go based on that. Um, but I agree with the points that you made, Ian, around the ceiling. And yeah, and everyone just has their own opinion. Some people think that, you know, O'Brien or Dow are, are lower in the pecking order than him. But I, I just don't agree because I, I still see those players as having high ceilings and can still be in that mm. premiership team for mine. Yeah, I think it's also like hard when you're doing like that was the thing that we did when we we're trying to do like the who comes in and who comes out was because he's on the senior list, it's so much harder um, to keep those guys on because everyone we're bringing in is on the mm. senior list. If we draft people, obviously in the national draft, that's going on the senior list. So the the ones that you'd probably say, like that maybe like a Cottrell and maybe an Oscar McDonald as guys that you'd maybe flick out before him, they have the benefit of being in the, on the rookie list. So there's a bigger chance that you're able to keep them because there's not too many ins and outs on, on that part of it. Um, I think as far as the comments that he made, like, I think at the start of it, it's all pretty fair I, at the start. You know, it makes sense that he's going to be a little bit annoyed. But then when he starts to, I guess, get a little bit more vocal in it, I, I think that's just a little bit of an unprofessional look, particularly if you're still trying to get picked up from other clubs um, to come off like bitter. Maybe you're right. He should have just taken it an extra day. It seemed raw. Like he was always throwing around words. And I think even when he said, I don't want to throw around the word toxic or whatever, it's yeah. like, well, you just did. So you, you sort of... <laughs> Yeah. I, I hate when people do that personally. Um, I guess I'm probably not as frustrated, maybe just me, because I'm maybe not as emotionally connected with Gibbo and I probably saw that he was someone that was going to go. Um, but yeah, it's definitely not a good look from him to be saying that. And then, yeah, I, I can understand his fr frustration around the midfield because we, I guess, yes, he definitely played somewhat in the midfield, but I don't think he was ever really given the best opportunity of, okay, you're you know attending the centre bounces and here's a couple of games of you playing 100% midfield. Now, who knows? Maybe there was a reason he didn't play that. Was his tank not good enough? Was, was he not doing mm. the, the work in training? Like, well, those, those are things we'll never know. Um, and probably the other thing I wanted to mention was, you know, him saying, oh, they saw my best position as a midfielder. It's like, well, maybe the new people coming in and Vossi and all these guys went, yeah, 
you were the best midfielder in the VFL, of course you're going to be a midfielder now. That's where we see your best position. There's other guys that we like in the small forward. You're only doing that because of a makeshift reason. And now he's going, oh, well, am I not a midfielder? I'm a small forward. It's like, well, what do you want? Do you want to play midfield? Do you not want to play midfield? Yeah, I don't know. It's a, yeah. it's a little bit of a weird one from Mickey. See, I'm really passionate. I think why I'm getting so worked up is because there is this is a little microcosm of of not just AFL but society in general. Um, and you, you mentioned Ian, like he, he said, oh, I don't want to use the word toxic. Well, why don't you be a fucking man? You want to be a hero and come on the airwaves, mm. and throw out words, stand by your word. You thought it was mm. toxic, no worries. Um, maybe it was toxic, but then. As he kept going, I'm waiting. Maybe he's going to say, but at the end of the day, it's on the players and for us to perform. I didn't hear that. I didn't hear one thing about him saying, I could have done this better or I need to improve on this to get a second chance. And I'll give you an example of what someone who has recognized their shortcomings and what they're going to do about it. This is Corey Durden on an interview not not a few days ago um, on a podcast called Into the Fire with the young fella. I don't know his name. I'm very sorry about that. But the channel's called Into the Fire. Just have a listen to this. You had a lot of positives from the commentators, and rightly so. Your forward pressure was enormous. However, your disposals were a little low for you. Is that something you're looking to increase on next year? Yeah, certainly. I think uh, that's probably something I sort of struggled with throughout the year is just involvement in the game. Um, my pressure is probably like my biggest strength yeah. and something I really pride myself on. But if I can get more involved in the game, I think I have a really good impact as a small forward. And uh, part of that, the way I'm going to improve it is just by getting my work rate and fitness up. So mm. identified, this is where I'm not strong at. And this is what I'm going to do to improve it. This is how I'm going to fix it. And it brings me back. And I think where I started, where the flame started coming from, I was getting comments in my DMs on, on Instagram from, from younger, you know, kids, teenagers saying, oh, it's unfair, this and that. And then I'm like, is anyone missing the point here? Life is not fair. It's unfair. It's tough. We're going through a lockdown. There are a lot of small, it's tough. AFL is a tough gig. The pressures, the isolation, all of that, it's all very tough. But the reality is only the strong survive and only the strongest thrive. It's just that, like, what are we going to sit here and sob about it for? You know, there's there's two types of reactions when you have such breakups. It's you're either going to complain about it or you're going to be the person and, and, and seek attention and seek validation for, for how bad you have it and unfair it is, or you're going to get the fuck on with it and you're going to move on and become better from it. And I just was shocked that he didn't take that second approach and, and um and just use the motivation internally like don't don't prove yourself to everyone by telling people that you're going to prove everyone wrong Deontay Wilder did that for the last two years said he's going to prove everyone wrong until he didn't and I, I just think we've got to be very careful we're trying to set an example for kids let's not do it by complaining about what's going on and how life's unfair because you're setting them up for failure thinking that this is some fairy tale this is a tough place to live in we're lucky to wake up every day you know Hmm. And maybe that's honestly like not to be disrespectful to him, but like maybe that's literally the reason that he didn't become like our best midfielder and why he may not be on an AFL list next year, because maybe that's the, the route he takes every time that he just doesn't have that competitive edge that can make him one of the better AFL players because he, he win maybe whinges a little bit and he doesn't get things his way and he doesn't take all those steps. And I think to some degree, when he was asked to play small forward, it seems like he was pretty happy to be like, okay, what can I do on the list to do that? Um, and he, he did a decent job at it, but maybe, you know, he was an okay, you know, small forward. And that's why he couldn't be a really good small forward and stay on the list. Yeah. And, and like was alluded to earlier, like all we see is these comments and what we know in the, in the public, we don't know what he was like at training, whether they were like, right, Here's some benchmarks we want you to hit, and then you're going to get that midfield time. Maybe didn't do it and didn't hit them. You, you never know those things. And uh, I'm looking now to the future for him. And yes. like, is there is there a team in the league that he walks into their midfield, the starting midfield? Because I don't necessarily think so. If I'm a winning organization with winning principles and premiership standards, I'm not even touching him. Because I know yeah. that if he doesn't get his way, he's going to think some other way about it. Like I'm, I'm personally, that's my take. I, I was very, I was really disappointed with it because nothing is given, like nothing is given in this life, nothing at all. No, none of us, none of us, earn, you know, we, we don't, um, no, no one uh, deserves anything. You got to earn it. You got to earn your way. 
Um, sit here and sulk about it all you like, or you can just get back to the work. So um, that's how I feel about that. I feel really, really strongly about that because I, I think when I saw the youngins messaging about it, saying it was unfair, it really sparked something in me. It's like it's not how I live my life, and that doesn't mean everyone's going to do it my way. But I, I think there is a, a serious problem with that. I actually put together a little clip that I'm going to play on motivation and and there's some home truths in there and i hope um i hope we can all learn something from this i don't think complaining and whining really solves the problem this is jackie robinson first black major leaguer had it in his contract not to complain if people spit on him now i don't care if you're jackie robinson or if you're a guy like me who's only got a couple of months to live you can choose to take your finite time and energy and effort and you can spend it complaining or you can spend it playing the game hard, which is probably going to be more helpful to you in the long run. The real problem, which, by the way, no one ever talks about, is that everywhere we look at society, we celebrate victimhood. We are no longer celebrating people who put in the work. We are no longer celebrating people who overcome. Instead, we are celebrating people who have the saddest story. Well, let me tell you something, guys. You can compete for that your entire life and nobody's gonna bring you a thing except a couple likes and a couple bull comments that people don't mean. I was a fucking pathetic motherfucker, man. People cannot say that to themselves. It's, we have to choose these great fucking magical words that make people feel good. Tell yourself the truth. The only people that are going to win are going to be the people who recognize the opportunity to improve when they get punched in the fucking face. I see a lot of stories talking about how fucking hard people have it. It's one thing to share stories about how hard things are when you've overcame those things. It's a whole nother thing to share those stories about how hard things are so that you get attention. The ones that keep telling the sad story. You need to understand something. No one gives a fuck about your sad story unless you're doing something to overcome it. You're not inspiring anybody. You're not empowering anybody. You're pacifying people and trying to convince them to be more like you, someone who will not execute against the problems that they already know that, they're, that they have. No one gives a shit about your struggles. No one gives a shit how hard you have it. And to be completely fucking honest, you don't have it that fucking hard. Okay? 